Good evening, everybody. This is Darius Asemi with GV Wire. Welcome to another episode of Unfiltered. Uh, Steve Brandau has the evening off, uh, and Mike Krabasi is joining us through Zoom. Good evening, Mike. Hey, Darius. Good, Darius, good, to, be good to be with you. Um, thank you, Mike. Uh, we have a great show uh, for you this evening. Uh, the main topic is cannabis. We have uh, two great uh, guests with us, Courtney Karen the attorney and founder uh, of Adamant Law Group and the spokesperson for the art, artistry, a cannabis store here in, in North Fresno. Welcome, Courtney. And also Lauren Fontaine, co uh, founder and chief compliance officer at the artistry. Welcome, Lauren. Oh, who will join us at 6.30, actually. I just, just found that out. Okay, uh, before we get into all things cannabis, uh, let's start off with a poll that I actually did not put up last week. Paul reminded me, hey, I forgot this poll. So here it is. Sh uh, California, uh, should pause high-speed rail or build, the build new dams with the money? It sounds like uh, the number one response was pause high-speed rail to build new dams, uh, followed by build new dams for more water storage. Uh, very few people wanted to actually finish high, finish high speed rail. Um, and 5% uh, of you said, don't fund either. Anyhow, that was a poll from last week. This week's poll, uh, let's put that one up. Cannabis is legal in 21 states uh, in our country. And what should the feds do? make it legal, fully legal in all states, 40% of you, of our respondents, said yes to that. <clears throat> then 24% uh, each uh, to be left for states to decide, and 24% uh, for medicinal use only, and very few people, 12% only, said it should be illegal everywhere. Okay? So with that out of the way, <clears throat> A uh, couple other things uh, we have, uh, I just want to review with you guys before we jump into cannabis. Uh, let's start off with uh, slide five. The feds say they have busted Fresno's catalytic converter theft kingpin. Article on GV Wire. Um, Bill McEwen wrote this article. Please take a look at it. I know many people have lost their catalytic converters. Uh, and it's a pain in the rear to get it replaced at a huge cost between a thousand and several thousand dollars, depending on the kind of car you drive. And uh, fed, the feds say they've busted the, the person that's been stealing these catalytic converters. So go to gvwire.com for more of that uh, information on that article. And um, restaurants with natural gas ban battle in California City. Another article that uh, we posted, uh, what's happening to the future of natural gas in restaurants and in, in homes. Uh, that article came out, it was actually an Associated Press article. Go to gbwire.com for more information on that. Um, and uh, Mike, any comments on either one of these? So as a former well, restaurant tour, I really, I have, really enough have enough trouble. trouble. I, don't I don't want the government, government telling me I can't use natural, use natural gas, gas versus, versus electric. electric. Electric is not as reliable in my opinion. And it is a pain to clean those electric cooktops. So I think this is a major victory for common sense. And I'm glad that restaurants have some win in this state. And let's put up also number six, uh, Senator, Senator Jerry Brown. Newsom faces dilemma if Feinstein resigns. Uh, any thoughts on this, Mike? Because the well, governor... Lime, Lime... Go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. I always wondered, I always why, wondered the why the governor wouldn't, wouldn't just resign, resign and, then and then get appointed by the new by the lieutenant new... governor, Kulinakis. Kulinakis will become governor. Maybe then he can go to the Senate. I, I think that may be a move that he should consider versus bringing someone like Jerry Brown on board. I mean, Jerry Brown's a very popular governor. Um, I'm still upset over Prop 57 and what he did on that issue, but uh, we'll see what happens. Okay, and with that... Um... Oh, let's, let's put up seven also. Extra spring COVID booster uh, for high-risk adults. So there's a new booster uh, 
that have just got cleared and approved for high-risk adults. If anybody's interested in that, please check out again gvwire.com. And with that, uh, anything else, Mike, you want to discuss before we dive into cannabis? <clears throat> I think everyone's eager for the really hot topic tonight, so let's get to it. Okay. Let's, let's dive into cannabis, the pros and the cons. I'm going to give a brief uh, background, uh, and we'll start with our slide number, the, 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 the bad. Let's start with the bad first. Put that up. Okay. Uh, here's some of the negative things about cannabis, which uh, most of us already know. Uh, and and the, the, the sources are underneath them. So, used by teens harms <clears throat> brain development. The second uh, bad thing about cannabis can become an addictive drug for some people. Can harm people at risk for mental health disorders. Poses risks to baby during uh, pregnancy. May increase heart attack, heart attack risk can be harmful to lungs, and not safe to drive uh, after consumption. That's the bad. Um, now let's put up the good. And the, again, the sources are just below each line item. Please pay attention to that. <clears throat> FDA approved cannabid can cannabidoil for children with rare, rare form of epilepsy. So from the FDA can help reduce anxiety in the appropriate amount, can relieve also chronic pain and nausea. In some, a lot of folks uh, have been prescribed a medicinal marijuana that have cancer uh, for that reason. Helps people with multiple sclerosis, and again, it reduces nausea, nausea, vomiting in chemotherapy patients. So those are some of the pros and cons that uh, we, we dug up doing some research on uh, pros and cons of cannabis. <clears throat> One other, uh, just a couple other background pieces, and I would like maybe Courtney, since you have a law degree, to kind of maybe comment on these as we fire this up. So 1937 is when cannabis was uh, made illegal. 1951, the Boggs Act actually, I think, uh, exa uh, accentuated that. And in 1970... The, it became, it, it, the, the, the sentencing became more clear, clarified. And I'd like to kind of get uh, Courtney's thoughts um, and, and comments on why it became illegal. There's, you know, some theories that DuPont, did, 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 here's a question, did DuPont have anything to do with it uh, because of all the uses of uh, hemp? Uh, now, hemp is legal nationwide. That happened under a Republican Senate. Uh, Mitch McConnell of Kentucky kind of drove that. But uh, maybe, uh, so let me just turn it over to Courtney. Let's start off with, uh, if, you, if you have the information on the, on the history of, of why is um, cannabis illegal in the United States? Does it, does it have anything to do with the chemical manufacturing industry or DuPont at all? Do you, if, if you do know, if you don't know, that's okay. I didn't hear I the didn't last, hear the thing, last you, thing that you said. Neither, that, neither, that, neither did, I, did I, but I but think I that, think it, that was just, it was just so powerful that the mic <laughs> couldn't take it anymore. Um, there we the go. We're back. You, you had just said something. something. Was, the question is, um, the, when did it become illegal? It, it sounds like it was 1937. And is that the U.S. chemical industry, like DuPont and any of those folks, have anything to do with that, or is this is that just a conspiracy theory? Okay, so okay. Um, I think we can back up even a little bit earlier than 1937. Really, in um, I mean, the, hemp was utilized, you know, in the I mean, as far back as the 1600s to the 1890s, we saw hemp utilized in um, the United States for a variety of different purposes, and then in 1906. Um, the Pure Food and Drug Act was enacted. And this was where they were requiring the, the first labeling, which is kind of interesting because now in the state of California specifically, um, labeling of, of cannabis is so very important. But this dates back to 1906, where anything that had cannabis contained in it had to be labeled as far back as 1906. 
And if we then move over to around 1900 to the 1920s, we saw that there was a lot of Mexican immigration at that point in time. And so right after the Mexican Revolution in 1910, um, there was a whole bunch of Mexican immigration that flooded into the United States. And um, you know, many sources uh, that, I, that I was reviewing before this call cited to the fact that this is where they really pinpoint the first use of, of um, you know, recreational use of marijuana in the United States. Um, and what that led to uh, in the 1930s um, was the, uh, you know, the banning of cannabis um, in 29 different states. Um, uh, they, they weren't calling it cannabis really then, we were just calling it marijuana. So um, by 1931, 29 states had outlawed, outlawed marijuana. And that was because there was this research that had been developed. I'm not exactly sure by who, but there was research that had come about that was sort of linking marijuana use with violent crimes and societal deviant behaviors primarily committed by what they were referring to as racially inferior or underclass um, communities. And so at that point in time, um, you know, legislation was enacted in 29 different states to outlaw, outlaw marijuana. Um, and then we come, you know, down to um, 1936, there's some propaganda films that are put out by the French, Reefer Madness was one of the most popular ones. And then Hollywood steps in and says, okay, that's it, no marijuana in any, um, you know, no marijuana or narcotics in any of these films that we're producing. And they sort of, um, you know, add to this whole fear of, um, of drug use and marijuana. And now we're up to 37, where we have the Marijuana Tax Act. And um, the Marijuana Tax Act was uh, essentially, they were trying to, you know, fight against um, what they call, refer to as the evil weed, which is funny to me um, for a number of reasons. Um, and this was supposed to be an excise tax um, for anybody who had medicinal and industrial uses for marijuana. But then we go to 1944, uh, about two decades after the initial reports came out or 14 years after the initial reports came out and the New York Academy of Medicine says, you know what, all these studies that everybody did saying that marijuana was inciting violence and insanity, sex crimes or, or addiction is completely false. And so everybody takes a step back and says, hmm, so who do we believe? Everybody from the 30s that were saying that all of these crimes that were occurring were occurring because immigrants were using cannabis or um, was this perhaps maybe a coincidence um, or was it maybe motivated by some other factors? Um, and then we get to World War II and all of a sudden we need hemp and we need hemp pretty badly because um, it's a, a commodity used for marine cordage and, and several other um, you know, very industrial items used. And so farmers are given the opportunity to start planting hemp. The government is giving them back the seeds and saying, help us plant the hemp. Um, we'll go ahead and defer your, um, you know, draft uh, spot for World War II if you'll just go ahead and start growing. And so 375 acres of hemp are grown in the 40s as a way to, um, you know, aid um, uh, during World War, World War II. Um, and then pretty much from then on, we start having different acts uh, from the 50s to, to the 90s. Um, and, you know, of course, the DEA is formed um, and we're, we're starting to really hone in on like, OK, marijuana is bad, marijuana is bad. But there isn't anything that's happened in between any of these years from 37 to now um, that's different from the beliefs that occurred in 1937, it really comes down to, in, in my mind, just political factors, um, different po politicians' beliefs of what cannabis really was and wasn't doing in their communities, which just led to legislation being enacted. And so if you look over the course of time, there's not one specific incident that occurred where there was, um, let's say somebody who, somebody went, who and went and shot up shot a bunch up. of kids in a, a elementary school because they smoked a joint. It wasn't something like that, um, you know, that occurred. Um, it was just uh, politicians believing that cannabis and marijuana use was going to negatively affect people in different societies and communities. And so, um, you know, we get to the 90s, uh, late 80s, early 90s, we've got Bush's war on drugs. And um, then finally by 96, things start to kind of even out and we get Proposition 215 through. Um, and at that point in time, medical marijuana starts to be utilized a little bit, um, a little bit more readily in each of the states that, that um, have individuals who are interested in using medical marijuana. So 
I wish I could say that there was one point in history where there was this really big thing that happened that made everybody say, okay, this is why marijuana is bad, but really there isn't. Um, it's just a course of time over each decade with legislation getting stricter and stricter and stricter in each of the states and at the federal level, um, and eventually ended up with a federal ban of marijuana altogether. Got it. Thank you, for, Courtney, for that great background. Uh, just the NBA, I think this just, just recently happened, is removing marijuana from its list of banned substances as part of a new collective bargaining agreement. Uh, were you aware of that, Courtney? I think this just happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah I actually, I, I, I did, did see, see that see come that. through the come news through the other day. day. I, I, I get, a get a report every morning, every morning of, of um, just, um, just different, different um, marijuana, marijuana cannabis related, related news, news events. events. And this and one this came one to my came attention. To my and attention and I did think I did that think it was pretty interesting. interesting. Um, um, I, I think we're going to see more, more of this in different industries, not just basketball as a profession, but other industries, specifically because of the medicinal uses of cannabis. There are, you know, you did a nice job putting up your pros and your cons in the beginning of this segment. Um, and we did see on, on the pro side that medicinal cannabis use can be very effective for individuals that have certain types of ailments. And chronic pain is one of those ailments. And um, I, I, while I don't know exactly why the NBA made that decision, I haven't had time to really uh, investigate that. I would assume that it must have something to do with the fact that, you know, when you are a professional athlete at um, playing as many games as you are in the NBA and working as hard as you are at that level, that perhaps you, you may have a player or two who needs marijuana for medicinal purpose uses and per preventing them from having that available could be detrimental. Got it. Thank you. Uh, I'm going <clears> to <throat> ask you a few other questions on, on uh, why are only two stores open. But, but before we get there, uh, Johnny uh, Soto on GB Wire's team put together a great documentary that should be up over the next uh, few days on, on the website. But we're going to show you, give you a brief preview. I don't know if that preview is ready yet or not. We're going to show maybe the first uh, 90 seconds. Uh, it's a great history uh, of. Um, yeah, let's, let's, let's roll that up. It's been the topic of controversial debate for just about its entire existence. But why? Are there any real benefits associated with its consumption? And does it hinder development of the body or brain? With its recent legalization across the country and the world, one might even wonder, why was it ever illegal to begin with? We explore those questions and more in this GV Docs presentation of Evergreen, the story of cannabis. Cannabis dates as far back as 10,000 years ago. It was one of the first crops grown when farming began. Hemp, a variety of the cannabis plant, has been consistently used in places like ancient China to create stuff like clothing and rope. Hemp was and still is non-psychoactive which means it doesn't affect the mind or mental processes. In other words, if you smoke it, you will not get high. The first recorded use of the cannabis plant that does get you high was approximately 2737 BCE. Emperor Shen Neng of China used the plant as medicine for things like gout and malaria. Throughout the next 3,000 years, cannabis use for medicinal purposes slowly spread throughout Asia and into Europe. The Chinese mixed it into food, and in ancient India, they mixed it into a drink called Bang. Prior to that, in Greece, cannabis seeds had been consumed recreationally, and in second century, Century CE, the Greek doctor Galen prescribed cannabis as medicine to treat pain in patients undergoing surgery. Cannabis was pretty popular in the Middle East as well. Muslims there weren't supposed to drink wine, but nobody said they couldn't smoke grass or hashish, as they called it. Christopher Columbus brought rope made of hemp on his first voyage to the New World in 1492, and both French and British had their colonists grow cannabis regularly. Fast forward to the 1800s. Cannabis is a major trade item around the world, and doctors everywhere are recommending cannabis for its medicinal uses. Cannabis plantations are scattered throughout the U.S., prescribed regularly by doctors and easily bought in general stores. In the late 1800s, the rise of alcoholism and opium addiction would cause people to question the safety of cannabis and its effects on the brain. Early 1900s, the progressive era swept the US and many progressives called for stricter regulations against potentially harmful drugs. Meanwhile, cannabis was becoming known more as a recreational drug as opposed to a medicinal one with people commonly smoking it in cigarettes and pipes. Many Mexicans in particular smoked cannabis at the time and after millions of illegal Mexican immigrants flooded into the US due to the Mexican Revolution, they brought the habit along with them. They called cannabis marijuana, and Mexicans became strongly associated with the drug. Perhaps one man is responsible for cannabis becoming illegal more so than any other person in history. This guy, Harry Anslinger, 
Anslinger was the first commissioner of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. He launched a relentless campaign against cannabis, testifying before Congress to get them to make the plant illegal. The following are actual quotes from Anslinger. There are more than 100,000 total marijuana smokers in the U.S., and most are Negroes, Hispanics, Filipinos, and entertainers. Their satanic music, jazz, and swing result from marijuana use. This marijuana causes white women to seek sexual relations with Negroes, entertainers, and any others. Reefer makes darkies think they're as good as white men. Marijuana is the most violence-causing drug in the history of mankind. Anslinger carefully chose his words to instill fear into the American public about cannabis. Notice how he refers to cannabis as marijuana to make it sound more foreign, causing it to be associated with immigrants. From this point forward, marijuana became the most common way of referring to the drug. He also led a mass media propaganda and a campaign against cannabis. The film Reefer Madness, produced by Anslinger and Friends, showed good people getting violent and going crazy simply due to smoking uh, marijuana. The, the film was seen by millions and helped Anslinger convince Congress to pass oh, the marijuana tax. There we go. Okay, to watch the rest of that uh, uh, video, uh, you, you can see all of it at on uh, gbwire.com. Uh, hopefully sometime uh, tomorrow afternoon. We also have a brief video, which I'm going to show later on, on what does inside of artistry look like? Uh, but uh, before we get there, a question for you, Courtney. Why are only two stores open? I think the city of Fresno, and Mike, if you can correct me, the city of Fresno has approved like 17 licenses. Is that correct? 19. Is Mike still with us? Yep. Okay. Only Mike, two, only two correct. open, correct. Is that 17? I believe so. Yes, only two are open. Yeah. Courtney, why are only two stores open out of the 17 licenses that have been uh, handed out? So the, there's actually 19 preliminary approvals that were given. And of those 19, only two have opened. So you have Embark and The Artist Tree. And um, I mean, I think there's a variety of reasons that we can set. I would like to say it's because The Artist Tree and Embark are um, you know, truly professional at what we do. And, and we are um, just excellent at understanding um, the assignment and knowing how to um, find our way through the entitlement process and to get our businesses open. But the reason I don't think that's the only reason why is because many of the groups that won licenses in Fresno are also very skilled operators in other locations in the state of California. Um, over this past year, we certainly have seen um, some problems in the supply chain for cannabis in California, um, specifically at the manufacturing and the cultivation level. There's just been an oversupply of product, which has, um, you know, certainly decreased the, the, the price margin um, for products in, um, you know, for those growers and for those manufacturers. Um, some of our, our cannabis licenses are, are currently held by companies that are vertically integrated. So maybe they're feeling a little bit of a pinch financially. Um, you know, due to some of those uh, supply chain overcrowding um, over the last year. Also, I think that uh, this process has taken quite a bit of time. And while we were able to navigate it really quickly, um, you know, we applied for these licenses two, two and a half years ago. And um, for many companies, two, two and a half years ago, your um, projection of, of which project would be next or um, where your priorities are was probably very different than where it is now. Um, and so for some companies, um, perhaps they didn't really have the funding that they claimed that they had in their application. Um, perhaps that they really didn't have the infrastructure that they claimed in their application to be able to bring these these businesses forward. Um, while I can't speak for any other company other than my own because I don't really know the inner workings of their financial situation or um, you know their company structure, I can say that that for for us it has been quite a big surprise. We have been expecting to see somebody else come online for some time, um, just because there are some some operators there that are very skilled um, in this industry. Um, I do know that Culture Cannabis Club is going to be coming soon. Um, we uh, frequently try to communicate with other um, retailers and with the city on, on who's going to be coming next because, um, believe it or not, it's really, it, it really is needed, another store in Fresno. Um, and so uh, we, have under, we understand and have heard that um, Culture Cannabis Club will be coming hopefully within the next few months, and um, that will be another opportunity for um, consumers in the city of Fresno. What was the name of the other store that you just said? So only two of you guys are open. Embark. Um, so Lauren Carpenter 
spoke last time with me on your show, and she is the, the CEO and, and a founder of Embark. And then you've got um, the artist tree. So that's it. That's it. That's all that's open. <laughs> and uh, Mike, I don't know if you can verify. Oh, Mike is gone. I had to go, I had to go. Okay. Uh, it sounds, uh, uh, it's, and I don't know if uh, Courtney can verify this or not, but roughly half a million to a million dollars in taxes are generated by each store to the city of Fresno. And originally, and if you can put that slide up, I think we had a quote from uh, Council Member Esparza. That number uh, was going to be about you know over five million dollars in revenue uh, for the city of Fresno just in the taxes from each from all the stores combined. Uh, but of course, only two being open, that, that those numbers are substantially down. So, um, one I think one of the reasons, uh, well. City of Fresno decided to open stores. I was hoping Mike would be here to uh, to address that. Is the incredible amount of added revenue coming into the city? Uh, okay, uh, and it sounds like Lauren is uh, just joined us, who is the found, one of the founders or the founder and chief compliance officer at at the Artist Tree. Let's welcome Lauren. Yay! Good evening. Yay. Hi. How are you all doing? <laughs> Good. Um, okay, so we were just talking about the revenues for this for the city for the city of Fresno. Uh, you know, over five million dollars at, at when all the stores are are open. But it sounds like only two are open out of the nineteen. Seventeen other licenses have have been issued, but a lot of uh, money has to go in to get those off the ground. And I guess those are still uh, well. None of those other uh, seventeen are open yet. Uh, do either one of you know if any is there a third store going to be opening up soon? Culture Culture Cannabis Club should be coming within the next few months. Um, we don't know the exact date or anything like that, but I have heard that that they're well on their way. <laughs> what town is that? In? It's called Culture. You said? Yeah, Culture. Yeah, culture um, um, I think it's uh, somewhere on Bullard. I can't quite remember actually, but I think it's um, District Four or District Six. One of those two. District. Dis mm -hmm. Any comments uh, from Lauren on uh, on on cannabis or cannabis sales and how your store is doing? We have a, by the way, we have a brief video. Uh, I don't know if Chad has that ready yet or not to to put up on what the inside of your store looks like. Is that ready to go? Yeah. But let's play that video. It's been the topic of controversy. Just shop in a day. If I could just scan your ID, please. Thank you so much. Whenever you're ready to place that order, head to that line on the right side. We'll have a guide member assist you, okay? Lemonade, fruit punch, strawberry kiwi, cannabis infused, life H2O, original cola, root beer, good resin, cured resin, vape cartridge, liquid resin vape cartridge. Where's the good old fashioned marijuana? Okay, uh, thank you for showing that. So that was a glimpse inside your store uh, that you sell uh, stuff for medicinal use and for recreational use, correct? Yes, that's right. Let me see if there's any questions uh, from our audience on this live show. I don't see any questions for either one of you. Um, so, so let me go back to the history. So there's basically no connection between any of the other major industries in, in our country back in the 30s and banning or making uh, hemp, well, not hemp, uh, cannabis illegal. Um, Lauren, he was asking if we had any uh, understanding on whether or not the DuPont company had anything to do with 
the legalization or banning of cannabis, but I don't personally have any understanding or knowledge of that. Have you heard that or anything like that? Necessarily, just, but, but any other uh, company or manufacturer, there were some rumors floating around on the web that, that that was going on, but it sounded like there was really no connection. It just became a, 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 a psychoactive issues of the of the drug that made it basically illegal in our country back in 1931, correct? 37, I'm sorry. Yeah, we started okay. to see the first bans around 37, and then they really just increased from there. But um, I, I was going to say, you know, it it really wasn't until, you know, the, the, the se late 70s, early 80s, and even into the mid 80s, that it really became a, a highly publicized issue in the United States. Um, it really, when President George Bush was um, stepping into office, that's when there were lots of parent lobbying groups um, who teamed up with the DEA and the National Institute of Drug Abuse um, to try to find ways to make cannabis products, marijuana, less available to youth. But there was something about that that I wanted to point out. Um, you know, all parents are concerned about their children um, obtaining drugs and utilizing drugs at a young age. Like, even as cannabis entrepreneurs, we still consider these factors as mothers of our own children. But our stores don't provide an opportunity in any way, shape, or form for youth to buy cannabis. What does is the illicit market. So the illegal market where cannabis is not regulated inside of a retail store is where children are purchasing cannabis. And I think that that's a really important factor to differentiate when we're having this conversation about policy and how the war on drugs began and cannabis became this um, you know, drug that everybody started panicking about the use of because what it comes down to is children consuming cannabis and how they receive that cannabis. Today, it's highly regulated in the state of California. There is no way a person under the age of 21 is getting through the doors of the artist tree. There just, there isn't. There are so many checks that we do and balances to ensure that that doesn't happen. So I think the real issue and the real topic here is how do we prevent cannabis from getting into the hands of youth? And that is cracking down on illegal cannabis operations. Those are really great points. But we know that the illegal cannabis sales are doing as well, correct? Or in some cases, better than uh, the legal. Uh, uh, is, is, that, is that a true statement? Or Lauren, Lauren, I would say, Lauren, you want to comment on that? Because I would say, yeah, it's a true statement. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know for certain, you know, the, I think that, I guess I'm not sure what percentage of the total market in California is legal versus unlicensed. Um, but I know that it definitely is a large portion of the market and something that continues to proliferate. And I think Fresno has done a better job than some other cities about cracking down on the unlicensed operators. Um, and in our Southern California stores, you know, we see it as a much bigger problem because cities like Los Angeles are not able to keep up. So there are many storefronts that still operate that are not licensed, whereas, you know, we haven't experienced that in Fresno, but I do still believe there are people, you know, that are selling it through unlicensed means there. A final question. Uh, where do you see the future of cannabis on a federal level? You know, several years ago, under the Trump administration, it looked like uh, the country was close to making cannabis potentially uh, legal or, uh, or removed as a class one drug. There was lots of rumors of that floating around, but that never happened. Uh, where do you see cannabis going on a federal level? Uh, 21 states have it legal. Uh, several others have it as medicinal. So where do you guys see the future of cannabis from a federal perspective? I think that, you know, the tide is slowly shifting. So I don't believe there'll be full legalization in the next five years, but potentially within the next 10 years. I do think that there are things that the federal government is moving toward that will help all the states that have legalized it, like repealing or 280E, which is a huge tax burden for cannabis operators right now because cannabis businesses cannot deduct business expenses the same way that other businesses can, um, which is you know a big financial burden to us. 
So, you know, there's legislation proposed to address that and other banking issues. And so, you know, that's showing that there's a will to kind of help all of the legal cannabis stores in different states. Um, but I do think there are many communities and states that are still opposed to it. And so, you know, in California, it's been around for a long time and it's generally accepted and more common, you know, and there's, but there are many other places where people are still opposed to it and, and don't believe that it's safe and, you know, don't want it to be fully legalized for recreational use. use. Right, like Texas, it's completely illegal, right? You can't, as medicinal... And Texas, Texas actually, actually doing a licensing. Doing, they're in the middle of a licensing program now, so they are actually going to let in a handful of operators um, for medicinal purposes first, which which typically then leads to adult use. So we are seeing some of the more conservative states um, realizing that there is some benefit, if not only for financial reasons through taxes, um, there are some benefits for allowing cannabis legally in their states. And so um, we will see some 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 licenses handed out in Texas within the next probably six months, I would think. Uh, and then in Canada, Canada, cannabis is legal nationwide, correct? So the whole entire country of Canada made it nationally legal for, canna for recreational use. Is that correct? Yep. Yes. <laughs> and then what is this significance of uh, 420, April 20th? And that's why we had this show tonight if you can tell our audience what's what's the significance of the this coming thursday happens to be a thursday this year of 420. so it is a um you know national cannabis day to those who are, consume and it's been around for decades it's on a new thing um i think it started in like the 60s um and there's different explanations for why it's At high school in san rafael five kids wanted to meet up um, and they pick their meeting time at 4.20 um, and that's when they just started consuming cannabis. There was this rumor for a long time that it was the 4.20 was the code for uh, the police call if you were having marijuana, but that's not actually true. Um, so it was just in San Rafael, some kids, you know, um, met up at 4.20 and then that started to catch on through pop culture in a number of different ways. And now we have 4.20 every year. So it's it's a day when people just want to want celebrate, to celebrate, right? So it's kind of a holiday for people that are cannabis consumers, and so they it, it is traditionally always our busiest day of the year ever since we were operating medical dispensaries, um, and you know for all, can, all cannabis dispensaries, it's their busiest day of the year because people are coming in, they want to get products to consume elsewhere, but they also just want to be kind of part of the fun. So it's kind of like you know, Black Friday or something where you just want to experience being in the store with lots of people. Usually stores have special deals and other celebrations and we'll be doing that. I see of the image there. So in addition to having discounts, we have a lot of fun things happening during the day on 420. So we'll have lots of DJs performing. We'll have free food in our parking lot. We'll have a lot of our brands giving out swag. Um, so it'll be just a big celebration for the community. Okay. So I'm going to put a couple of slides up again, starting with the bad. Uh, so if uh, consumed early before your brain is fully developed, it, there can be some harm by using cannabis. And this is what uh, we found, and those are the sources. Uh, and then the, 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 some of the, the positives of cannabis, we're going to put that up next. Uh, and by the way, we'll put these up on, on, our, on, on one of the stories up on GB Wire over the next day or two, uh, take a look at those. But so we, we uh, uh, let me go back to uh, uh, our, our guest, uh, Courtney and Lauren. So we know that, so we do we all agree if used as, at an early age before your brain is developed, it could do damage to brain development and cognitive skills, yes? Yeah, I think medical research has, you know, been conducted pretty heavily in, the, in that area. And I think that we would agree that um, while the brain is still developing, many substances would be inappropriate for a developing brain. Um, but certainly, um, you know, there are, are studies that have been conducted that have suggested that cannabis use um, for children and teenagers, um, you know, is, cer is certainly a more dangerous time to consume due to the development of the brain. 
And a lot of that uh, goes along with alcohol consumption as well. Uh, certainly, certainly. Yeah, right. Okay. Uh, any final comments from either one of you before we wrap the show up? Um, I would like to point, I, I don't know what you covered prior to me joining, but, you know, I, do, I would like to highlight the good, what you had on that list. Um, I've been in this industry since 2009, um, and it was, you know, mainly medical at that point in time. And so I've really dealt directly with a lot of patients that have come into our locations because they're using it for therapeutic purposes. And I'm a huge believer in that. Um, there's a lot of people that were going through chemo treatment or have other types of um, illnesses and health issues, whether they're mental health issues or whether they're things like Crohn's disease. Um, and, you know, cannabis for many of them is a life changer and it's extremely beneficial. So I think that it is really important to highlight all the positives of it um, for medical purposes. And I remember when we opened in Fresno, Courtney and I were there for the opening and there were some people that were we had a lot of older individuals come in and they were coming for medical reasons. And it was actually really great to see because they were so grateful they could have a place to come and get their medicinal things. And, you know, before they didn't really have easy access to it. So I think that's a really important thing to highlight um, to, you know, really promote widespread acceptance of it is that whether it's, you know, an actual uh, whether you're going through a serious illness or whether you have something like problems sleeping or anxiety, it can be a, a big help to people. And I know you had some points on there about children as well. And, you know, there's a debate about whether it's safe or not, but, you know, I do personally have know people that they have also used it as treatment for children with autism or epilepsy, where it's also been, you know, the one thing that can help their child where other types of medicine was ineffective. Um, so, I, you know, I think you know, it's, I really think it's important really important for people, for people, to, people realize to realize that, that there's, research there's research behind this, behind this and this can, and this be, can something be something that's, that's really um, a viable alternative to other forms of medicine. 30 seconds or less. Anything else from you, Courtney? Um, I would just like to say that we are so proud to be operating in the city of Fresno and to be operating, um, you know, really one of the best cannabis stores in the state of California. And we hope that um, you'll come out this week. Please don't necessarily wait until 420 to come see us. Uh, come out a little bit sooner. You'll have shorter lines and shorter waits if you do. Um, but if you do join us on 420, be patient with us. We're going to be doing the best we can to um, make everybody's day great and to try to, um, you know, provide everybody with the products that they're seeking. Um, thank you for supporting, um, you know, the cannabis market in California. And, um, you know, we hope to to uh, consider uh, to to continue growing the cannabis market in in the city of Fresno. Uh, thank you, Courtney. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, there was really no other questions on our Facebook uh, feed. Uh, so with that, we showed you the pros, the cons, and um, uh, some of the uh, uh, information from our two, uh, two women that are founders and operators of uh, uh, one of the first stores in, in Fresno. And uh, with that, it's a wrap for this evening. We have a great show for you next week uh, on a lot of, it's, it's got a lot about foreign affairs. We're going to have a very special guest uh, that is involved on a national and international level talking about some of the U.S. foreign policies that's impacting folks across the world right now. Anyhow, with that, thank you for watching this episode of Unfiltered. Have a great week and good night.